So just before Christmas, I received a very generous gift from an anonymous viewer. I was quite taken aback, honestly, because not only am I an absolute sucker for Reese's Pieces, but there were movies in amongst the snacks too. And with this person being kind enough to send me a stack of the good stuff, the very least I could do was cover one of them. I'd also like to make it clear that I am very open to bribes in exchange for reviews. Most people have morals. I like Reese's Pieces and Trash. Abuse me. So, as a way of saying a hearty thank you, today I'm going to be taking a look at the 1988 psychological horror movie, The Brain. And the best way to describe this one is that it's a bit like a three-way cross between They Live, Halloween 3 and Brain Damage. The film follows Jim, a high schooler with a high IQ but a strong delinquent streak. Jim's doing fine in his classes, and it's remarked that he could even go as far as Harvard if he wanted to, but he also likes pulling pranks and getting his kicks. In fact, in one of the first scenes we see with Jim, he dumps a full brick of pure sodium into one of the toilets in the boys' room and watches on with a smirk as the entire place erupts with water. As Jim's trying to make a speedy getaway, however, he's cornered by the head teacher. He pulls him into his office, calls Jim's parents, and basically states that unless Jim changes drastically, the school will have no other option but to expel him. And it's here that we need to jump back just a smidge. That's because the actual opening of this film introduces us to Becky and her mother. Her mother's obsessed with a Dr. Phil Donahue type show starring a certain Dr. Blake, who talks about self-betterment and better lifestyle choices. Becky's mother begs Becky to come and watch the show, but Becky refuses, instead heading up to her room to quietly ride things out. While in there though, strange things start to happen. The dresser starts smoking, stuffed animals that she owns start uncontrollably bleeding, alien claws erupt out of her mirrors and walls, and the whole room starts to close in on her. It all gets a bit Nightmare on Elm Streety. But as quick as it starts, it all stops. Becky's mum heads up to see what all the noise is, and within minutes a tentacle erupts out of a stuffed animal and starts trying to strangle her. Becky grabs a pair of scissors and starts stabbing at the creature, only for the camera to then reveal that she's in fact stabbed her mum to death. The tentacle then throws Becky out of the window, killing her. Now, the reason I mention that is because their deaths are linked to Dr. Blake, as Becky had been sent to his research facility by the school because she had a delinquent streak too. A short time after being released from the facility, two other people ended up dead who'd also been referred there, and the school is really pushing for Jim to attend as a last resort or be expelled. After much poking and prodding, Jim agrees to go, but his partner Janet is quite hesitant to let him after hearing about what happened to Becky and her mum. Jim says he'll be extra careful, and the next day he drops by the facility, where almost immediately an inmate stops him and warns him that Dr. Blake is an alien along with most of the research staff. Somewhat shaken, Jim heads into his appointment, and Dr. Blake introduces himself and suggests a preliminary checkup. After hooking Jim up to a few machines, he asks him to focus on a screen, and it's here that we're introduced to the core concept of the film. In the back, behind a two-way mirror, are two of the Doctor's assistants and a large alien brain. The titular brain is able to hypnotically control most people into seeing things that aren't there and believing whatever it wants people to believe. It seems to thrive on taking control of people and will rapidly grow if it eats people. However, it runs into a spot of bother with Jim when it can't really control him, and worse still, it appears that he can somewhat control it. The brain becomes outraged at Jim and seems to decide to personally target him, because even after Dr. Blake has ended the session for the day, Jim continues to see the creature in his mind's eye. After Jim leaves the facility, one of the assistants gets cold feet about an upcoming proposed experiment, and so Dr. Blake feeds her to the brain, causing the alien to grow larger, stronger, and it sprouts a full-blown terrifying face. After the growth, it decides almost immediately that Jim is a threat, and while Jim is driving home, it decides to attack his car, stopping the brakes from working, flooring the accelerator, and eventually causing a tentacle to erupt out of the steering wheel. Jim flips the car and heads to a nearby diner to meet back up with Janet, who is amazed he's still alive. 
Jim tries to fill her in with what's going on, but he's a bit rambly, so Janet takes him into the back to get cleaned up. But while they're there, the front of house call for Janet to get back out on the floor as there's a rush on, leaving Jim alone for just a few moments where the hallucinations start again, and Jim erupts back into the diner to wreck up the place before one of Dr. Blake's assistants arrives, sedates Jim and takes him back to the facility. Janet's worried about Jim, so with a friend from the diner, the pair decide to head over to the research facility to find him, or to at least see what's going on. Meanwhile, Jim wakes up in a locked room only for one of the inmates to immediately break in and agree to swap places with him so he can escape. And just as Jim is breaking out of the facility via the boiler room, Janet and her friend are breaking into the facility via the boiler room. It's at this point that Dr. Blake's fiendish plan is revealed. The brain has now developed to such an extent that by channeling its hypnotic influence through a broadcast transmitter located outside of the facility, it's able to embed hypnotic messages into Dr. Blake's broadcasts that effectively enslave anyone watching. The plan is to broadcast a message encouraging viewers to get their families to watch, which will boost the ratings, enabling a national broadcast where the same thing will happen again, and then eventually a global broadcast that will almost fully enslave humanity to the brain and Dr. Blake's wishes. Meanwhile, down in the boiler room, Jim and Janet see the brain in all its weird puppety glory, and that's a shame because it means they can't be alive anymore. And thus, a brutal game of cat and mouse begins, as Jim and Janet go on the run and Dr. Blake uses the brain to broadcast a message out to his growing viewer base that Jim and Janet are brutal murderers who need to be returned to the facility ASAP. With Jim and Janet's own family turned against them and most of the town under the control of Dr. Blake, will the pair manage to clear their names and return the town to normal? Will Dr. Blake succeed in taking over the world? And is it really the case that the brain can be overpowered with a rampant case of the horny? All these and more will be answered if you take a chance on the brain. One of the first things I wanted to raise about the brain is its eerily similar parallels to brain damage. Both films came out in 1988, although Brain Damage did pip it to the post by about seven months. Both feature an alien species attaching themselves to teenagers as a way to feed themselves, and both feature said aliens shifting and warping reality as they see fit. The only difference really is the approach that the alien creature takes, with Brain Damage having an alien that prefers to use the nicely nicely approach to get people hooked before making the withdrawal so unbearable that they have no choice but to go back, whereas the brain runs with fear to keep them coming back, only really leaving them alone if they're docile and agree to do what it wants. Whether you prefer the honey or vinegar approach, I think these two films play off each other rather nicely, and the similarities are probably best drawn at a script level. The Brain is a somewhat darker script to brain damage, but it does still have a distinct campiness to it. There's a lot of melodrama throughout, and while the pacing isn't necessarily this film's strongest attributes, this is a film that in a change to my usual criticism, probably could have stood to slow down a bit and better explain itself, it is a film that does feel fairly breakneck. You never know what's going to happen next, and I don't think I can recall a single moment where I started clock watching or like things weren't progressing fast enough. In fact, it was actually quite the contrary. At times this film is border incoherent at how much it's trying to shove out the door. And that actually could be levelled as a bit of a criticism, honestly, because the sheer amount of info dumping on display is immense here. That's not to say the film isn't fun, though. The titular brain is a giant disembodied head that just sort of bounces about and looks like something the Jim Henson company rejected. Its entire character is basically based entirely around control or killing, and we get plenty of time in the script to really appreciate just how two-dimensional this monster really is. And tonally, where do I even begin? On top of all the madness the script has to level out, this is a Christmas movie. I just… I needed to air that. Because on top of the hentai grade tentacles, the mass info dumping and the ultra campness that soaks this production, dumping Christmas on top of this thing is just… perfect. 
Beyond that, the film is all over the place, being genuinely disturbingly dark in places and contrasting that with dialogue that reads like a 50s pulp novel in places and is delivered with more than its fair share of Christmas ham. This is a total two-tone script. Strip away the campiness and you have a somewhat gritty and bleak experience that, while maybe a little trite, is enjoyable. Strip away the bleakness and you have a 40s creature feature at its finest. Combined, the two are a unique flavour, but definitely not an unenjoyable one. The script was written by Barry Pearson. He has 19 writing credits with titles including Firebird 2015 AD, Plague and his last credit being a handful of episodes of Iron Road in 2009. Honestly, I'd say this was probably his best known work, and credit to him, it's definitely his most memorable script. The film was directed by Ed Hunt, who has 13 directing credits including titles such as Bloody Birthday, Alien Warrior and The Jungle Book The New Adventures of Mowgli. While the pair don't have that many heavy hitters on the credits front, it's nice to see something resembling a stable and steady hand present in the scripting and direction. And on the direction front? Well, it's pedestrian, and it kinda sucks that I have to say that, but it is. It's mostly competent, I can't fault it for that, but it just struggles really to bring anything from the director to this piece. It just looks and feels like a somewhat bigger budgeted TV movie from the 80s, and that's such a shame as I feel with just a little bit more of a push this absolutely bonkers script really could have flourished. There was real scope with this piece to either lean hard into being a bit more gory and grisly, or go a bit more out there with the hypnotic dreamy elements, and while there is a bit of guts and gore here on display, it's nowhere near the amount it could have had. I mean, Jim gets into a car crash and the only injuries he gets is a small cut on his cheek and an injured sweater. The dream sequences look like Sub Nightmare on Elm Street or Hellraiser type fodder, nothing particularly eye-opening, and I feel like had they put a bit more colour into those sequences or really played on the trippiness a bit more, this probably could have been presented a lot more memorably. Equally, a total crapshoot this movie has to deal with is the brain puppet itself, which, when it works well, is quite effective, but suffers from more than a few moments where it just looks like this giant, wobbly, decomposing bollock, which totally kills the mood of the piece at exactly the times when it needs the prop to look its most convincing. Direction of the cast is totally hit and miss as well, and it's very dependent on the performer. What I had a real problem deciphering with this film is whether the physical performances the cast give are down to an inexperience or a director who has difficulty explaining his vision. This is because some of the cast like Jim and Dr Blake are pretty decent on set. They try to make use of the space and its props, they react in a very naturalistic way that feels like the scene has been run through thoroughly with the director. Either that or they're very good improv actors. But other cast members, particularly the supporting cast, quite often look and feel a bit lost. Like they've just sort of been dumped on the set, told where the frame boundaries are, and then whatever happens in the scene happens. Now, this was not Ed's first rodeo, he'd been making movies since the 60s, but if it was a fault on his part, it may have been partly down to the fact that he was a bit rusty, given that he only made three films in the 80s with a three to four year gap between features. I don't know, I'm going to chalk this one down as a little bit of fault on both sides, but I'd be very interested in seeing if similar problems occurred in Ed's other works around this time. Overall, while I'd say that this film is doing all the right things to try and capture that horror slasher vibe that the late 80s was particularly renowned for, that's all it does, and I feel like the idea was really too good to waste on just passable direction. The cine suffers the same fate, but I'd say it was probably a bit stronger than the direction. Those over-the-top elements really do keep the cinematographers busy on set, and while there's definitely scope for improvement, it's all generally a bit flat without much interesting going on, simple static cuts for the most part, and it really would have been nice to see more Dutch angles, tracking shots, or I'd have even taken just a couple of decent dolly zooms at key points to help emphasise the whoa factor of some of the bits in this, 
as it stands, it's competent. But I think a lot of this film was saved in the editing. The way this thing is cut together is more in line with films like Nightmares in a Damaged Brain or Driller Killer, with quick cuts and flashes regularly interrupting the feature and creating a general sense of unease. So, David Nicholson, you've more than earned your paycheck on this one. The film would be a shadow of itself without the well-timed cuts, musical arrangements and subversion of expectations. On the performance front, as I mentioned earlier, we find quite a mixed bag depending on castability. Tom Bresnahan as Jim is a great leading man, he plays charismatic well, and whereas a lot of the mainstream lead males of the time tended to be pretty boys first and foremost, I kind of appreciate that Tom's performance here is actually a bit more personality driven. It's a rather realistic performance, and barring only a couple of moments of stupid that's really more the script's problem than the actor's, I really got on with him and thought he really brought a piece of himself to the role. David Gale as Dr. Blake is a rather subdued performance that I think works rather well. Given his slightly more bombastic performances in the Reanimator films, I feel that here, he approaches the role in a similar way to how Dan O'Herlihy played Connell Cochran in Halloween 3. His character knows the entire plan and all the weirdness that comes with it and generally treats people not in the know with a kind of passive, you have no idea, attitude, which I think is perfect for this role. Simply put, I think it was an excellent piece of casting. Of the main cast, Cynthia Preston is probably the weakest element. When she needs to step up as a strong female lead, she does fine, but I don't know whether it was her or the director, but she just has way too many scenes where she's screaming for what feels like five minutes solid. Her hypnotic acting isn't the finest I've seen either, and I feel she has rather been done dirty in the edit for this one. With a little more tightening up, I think she'd have had a much better performance on display. As it stands, while I liked some of the performance, I wasn't completely won over. I keep telling myself that this was only a third feature credit and one of her first in a leading role, but yeah, not the best. The rest of the cast are okay, but they're pretty much all avatars. They don't do much, if anything really at all, to stand out in any meaningful way, but I can't say they were awkward or awful, so on the whole I'd say the performances were passable. And given how deep the trough that is 80s horror films go, that's actually pretty respectable. And finally, the soundtrack, and a stronger and more defining score you'll seldom find. It's a synth-based piece, but it sounds rich rather than tinny. It has a very distinct bassy quality, and most importantly, it's used to help emphasise key moments in the film rather than just being stock produced and dumped in to fill the silences. This is a soundtrack that really works in the film's favour, and helps to tie everything together into a decent package that both holds the film together and helps boost the weaker elements of the Sinian direction. It's a more than decent attempt, and quite a bit better than what I was expecting. It's not something I'd spin on its own, but hey, if it works for the movie, that's where it counts. The Brain was released in the US in 1988 by International Video Entertainment. I can't seem to find any evidence of a UK VHS release, but it did get a DVD release in the UK both as a standalone release and as part of a couple of double feature multi-packs in the early 2000s. I can't pin a specific date down, but judging by the packaging I'd suggest it was between 2003 and 2005. And since then, it hasn't had any other kind of physical release. It is available on Amazon Prime Video to stream, but I think a nice cleaned up Blu-ray release of this with some decent extras would really help shore up what's otherwise a good solid late 80s creature flick. I had low expectations going into The Brain, but ultimately, I thought it was an enjoyable little monster movie. While I can't exactly say it subverts expectations, given this is the era that gave us Freddy and Elmer, it does a sturdy job of delivering what it wants to deliver. It is a little heavy handed in setting up plot points that'll come in handy later in the film, but I've got to say, this is just a super cheesy, super fun little romp that I absolutely savoured. And it came as no surprise to me that this got picked up by the MST3K team for one of their live tours. Definitely one worth checking out if you get the chance. While it's not perfect, I'm extremely grateful that my anonymous gift giver chose this film with me in mind. They very much scratched an itch for me. 
So special thanks to them once again, and this weekend, if you're struggling for films to watch, why not check out The Brain 